Now we're going to look at some um, aspects of solids. Uh, crystalline solids are really cool things. Here we got a couple of neat pictures. Uh, I don't remember what this one is, but those are some really cool looking crystals. That reminds me of quartz, quartz and gold. Okay, thank you. Uh, it reminds me of Superman's place up at the North Pole, right? With all the cool crystals. This is a snowflake, right? That's ice. If you ever have a chance to look at snowflakes, uh, they're just incredibly beautiful. These are crystalline solids. They have a long range repeating order to their ions or atoms um, or molecules. And so on the macroscopic scale, what we can see with our eyes is these beautiful geometric shapes, and those are a result of what's going on at the atoms and molecular levels. Well, how do we figure out how those atoms are, are arranged? Because they're too small for us to see. Um, and examining them with a, a scanning tunneling microscope is, is very difficult and can't be done for some substances. So we use um, X-ray crystallography to figure out the structure and how these things are arranged. So we've talked about this before. Electromagnetic waves interact with each other. They cause interference. And you can have constructive interference or destructive interference. And, and so what we do is um, we use x-rays and pass x-rays through the crystal and look at the interference patterns that are produced. So just like the, the light passing to through, yeah, light passing through two slits causes an interference pattern. Remember the guy with the box on the beach? Really cool stuff. It does the same thing with x-rays. Because x-rays are just electromagnetic radiation like visible light, it's just they're a lot higher energy. And they can go through stuff, right? So atoms within crystals have spacings of on the order of 100 picometers. And that is about the wavelength of x-rays. The distance between the two things has to be comparable to the distance, the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation. So x-rays are the right wavelength to use to examine crystals. So they take the x-rays um, and they pass them through um, a hole in a lead screen so that you can get just a nice little beam. And then you send that through the crystalline solid and you get a diffraction pattern, which you can see with an x-ray detector. The diffraction pattern gives us information about the spacing of the atoms or ions or molecules within the crystal. Um, hang on. So th this is the technique where they figure out how, like in a sodium chloride at, um, crystal, how are the sodium and, and chloride ions arranged? And what's the spacing between them? So you pass two x-rays with um, that are in phase. So you've got two waves coming in phase, and they're going to interact with the atoms and be reflected. Okay, When they're reflected, that causes x-ray 2 to travel farther than x-ray 1, because x-ray 1 hit the atom on the top layer, and x-ray 2 hit the atom on the bottom layer. And so there's a difference in which they travel. So here we've got um, an angle. This is angle theta. And A is the, um, let's see, we get constructive interference if the difference in path lengths, which is 2A, so the difference um, Ray 2 travels this distance A plus that distance A farther than Ray 1. If that distance is an integral number of wavelengths, we're going to get constructive interference. So if that equals one wavelength, then these will come out and be in phase together, and they will constructively interfere. If it is not an integral number, one, two, three, four wavelengths, then you'll get destructive interference. So what they do is they adjust the angle 
until you get constructive interference. So you just adjust the angle of the x-rays until the spots get as bright as they can get. And then you can calculate that distance using Bragg's Law. So n is the integer um, times the wavelength of the electro of the uh, uh, x-rays. And that's going to equal 2d sine theta. And so that's how they figure it out. Um, so usually what we do is we, we measure the angle, and then we calculate the distance. And so rearranging it gives us this. X-ray crystallography is used for all kinds of things. It was very important in determining the uh, double helix structure of DNA. And so it can be used on biochemical molecules. It can be used on all kinds of things. So very, very important technique. Um, let's just do one quick calculation here. The spacing between layers of molybdenum atoms is 157 picometers. Calculate the angle at which 154 picometer x-rays produce a maximum reflection for n equals 1. So we're looking for the angle. Um, so maybe let's just go back here and use Bragg's Law. n lambda equals 2d sine theta. So n lambda equals 2d sine of theta. Theta is the angle. And so that's what we're trying to find. So the sine of theta is going to equal n lambda over 2d. Well, they told us that n was 1. Lambda is the wavelength of the x-rays. So that's 154 picometers. And then we've got 2 in the denominator. And d is the distance between the layers, 157. Picometers. As long as these units are the same, they're going to cancel out, and we don't have to do any conversions. So we get 154 divided by 2 divided by 157. So the sine of theta equals 0 0.49044586. How do we get theta? Inverse sine. So you should have a button on your calculator for that. Oops, I don't know what I did there. So inverse sine. I'm getting uh, 29. You getting that? So 29.37 degrees. Anybody else get that? So that tells us that if we, if we put the x-ray beam in at an angle of 29.37 degrees above the surface, that we're going to get a maximum reflection. Significant figures kind of go out the window, at least for Chem 1A, when we talk about sine and inverse sine. We're not going to worry about it.